Thank you to Warby Parker for sponsoring this video. Warby Parker is a company offering prescription glasses, contacts, and sunglasses at a fraction of the price of most outlets and which you can get sent right to your door. So if you find yourself wanting to update your current look or just in need of some new glasses and like things brought to you, check out their home try-on kit which comprises whatever five frames you pick from their website such as these. These free home try-on kits come with no obligation to buy, a prepaid return label right in the box, and of course five pairs of glasses of your choice, which you then have five days to check out before sending them back. Alternatively, if you're a contact lens kind of person, they have those too with their breathable scout lenses, which are made from a super moist material that resists drying for lasting hydration and comfort. Back to the glasses, the glasses start at just $95, including prescription lenses which have anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings. The sunglasses also start at $95, including polarized lenses, scratch resistance, and 100% UV protection. They're also available with prescription lenses starting at $175. To get started, head over to warbyparker.com forward slash brain food to order your free home try-on kit today. And let's get into today's video, shall we? It's good to be the emperor, right? You can do emperor stuff and have fun all day long with everyone catering to your every whim. If you too would like to be an emperor, congratulations. You can click on the link below and bid on the title of Emperor of Rome. This is translated into modern terms what piqued the attention of Didius Julianus, the protagonist of our story today, who on a fine evening of March the 28th, 193 AD, decided to participate in the weirdest event seen in Rome yet, and Rome had seen many. The bidding for the role of emperor, chance for a life of epicness, right? Well, let's say winning the bid was the second worst thing to ever happen to Didius, the first thing, of course, being called Didius. To unravel this peculiar story, we must first go back to March the 28th, 193, and a little background leading up to it. To begin with, Commodus, yes, that Commodus, the problematic emperor, also known as Joaquin Phoenix, does not seem to have been killed by a former general turned gladiator in the arena, but was rather strangled in the bath by his wrestling partner in a plot led by Latus, the prefect of the Praetorian Guard. Latus, however, knew how the game was played. You only kill an emperor if you already have a replacement in place ready to step up and prevent chaos and revenge tendencies. Multiple examples from the past, such as the killing of Julius Caesar, had shown that if they didn't have a solid plan as to who would follow, it did not bode well for the plotters. The replacement Latus had in mind was a well-established politician and military commander by the name of Pertinax, and in order to get the rest of the Praetorian Guard on board with the plan and to ensure the easy transition after Commodus had been murdered, Latus promised a huge gift or donative in the name of the new emperor without clearing it with Pertinax first. The issue would bring Pertinax at odds with the Praetorian Guard. A staunch, honor-bound person, he did not speak the same language as the Praetorian Guard did. He expected that his soldiers would follow orders. They were not to be negotiated with, period. An indication of how unaccustomed the Praetorians were to harsh discipline is that they needed to be bribed by their commander-in-chief in the first place. And then there is the undeniable fact that from the get-go, they were somewhat skeptical about the rise of Pertinax. Unlike most of, well, everybody, the Praetorian Guard was actually quite happy under Commodus. He lived the high life as a gladiator, leading the Empire to ruin, sure, but the Praetorian Guard had it pretty easy. They did not guard the Rhine in some cold and soggy province in the north. They lived in Rome in the so-called Casa Praetoria, at a privileged spot east of the top of Quirinal Hill, not very far from the Termini Station in Rome today. When on duty guarding the palace, they could enjoy the debaucheries of Commodus firsthand. It was not just the most honored position in the military, but also the most coveted for its financial benefits and prestige. Now this staunch old man was drilling them as if they were some kind of common provincial soldiers. And on top of everything, he denied them their promised payment in full. So in the afternoon of March the 28th, 193, AD, a bunch of them, 200 according to the historian Cassius Dio, marched to the living quarters of Pertinax. The poor emperor sent his ally, the Praetorian prefect Latus, to calm his soldiers, but when Latus saw them, he thought it very wise, as a head-saving strategy, to accompany them instead. Soon afterwards, and in fact not long at all after having been proclaimed head of state, the disciplinarian emperor lay dead. He was 66 years old, and the demise of this all-in-all -all honorable person was caused by nothing else than a lack of skills when it comes to reading the room. In Machiavelli's The Prince, Pertinax would go on to serve as an example of how a prince can easily be hated for good qualities. Latus, seemingly assuming his role as an officer, stated the obvious. Killing the emperor is one thing, not having a replacement on the other hand can be really dangerous, especially since the military commander Pertinax was loved by the common soldiers who could seek revenge. It wasn't as if this sort of thing 
thing hadn't happened before. In principle, they didn't care who would become emperor. What they wanted, and that was the reason they clashed with Pertinax in the first place, was the payment due. So they thought of a splendid idea which would be frowned upon by contemporaries, an auction. Yep, the idea was to give the title of emperor to the highest bidder. Rome, of course, descended directly into turmoil. An emperor was always either the son of an emperor, be it adopted or by blood, or he had won the empire fair and square in the field of battle. But buying it? For the honor-bound ancient world, this was unimaginable. The first to begin bidding was a certain Sulpicianus, who was serving as prefect of Rome, kind of like a mayor. He had conveniently arrived at the Praetorian camp so that he could calm the situation, but really, he began bidding. Enter Marcus Didius Julianus. Sweet Didius was well connected, but rather the silent type. As a favorite of the mother of Marcus Aurelius, many doors were opened for him, and he had served in some important positions, such as senator and governor of the province of Upper Germany. And there he had enjoyed successes against invading Germanic tribes, which led him to become co consul, coincidentally with Pertinax in 175. In the coming years, he seemed content with smaller, rather relaxed positions, such as in Bithynia, modern northwest Turkey, and North Africa. After that, he returned to Rome, enjoying a calm life. During supper on an uneventful day, the news came. The emperor was dead, and the title was up for auction. Tradition dictates that although initially uninterested, his wife and daughter nagged him until he decided to enter the race. But as tradition was often written by biased misogynists, this tale could be a classic example of the popular win behind all evil trove, the type of thing with the apple. Whatever the case, Didius did end up wanting to win, so he went to the camp of the Praetorians. It is unclear what the situation with the other bidders was, but at the end, there was only Didius, who was standing outside the camp, as the soldiers did not let him in, with Sulpicianus inside the camp, who, by the way, was Didius' father-in-law. The soldiers arranged it thus that one would declare his bid, and then they would run to the fence and shout it to the other participants. This went on for a while, with the enthusiasm of the Praetorians rising with each bid. After hours, the amount rose to unimaginable heights. The final offer of Sulpicianus was 20,000 sestri for each Praetorian soldier. For context, the yearly salary of a simple soldier was something below 2,000 sestri. After hearing this from the fence, Didius, in a panic move, offered 25,000 per person, to which his father-in-law remained silent, and he had won. To be fair, Didius did show elements of a decent personality, as the first thing he asked as the winner of this weird auction was that the Praetorians spare the life of his rival. This was quite unusual, as normally, when there was more than one candidate for the diadem, only the winner survived. In ancient Rome, the known axiom was the rule, in the Game Thrones, you either win or die. After this event, the satisfied Praetorians accompanied their candidate for emperor to the Senate, the institution that could ratify the outcome of this farce. Because the senators knew better than to piss off the Praetorian guards, they just kind of went along with it. And so it was, Didius ruled happily ever after, gloriously leading the empire for 66 whole days. From the get-go, Didius was, by most accounts, one of the most unpopular emperors ever, mainly due to how he came to power, but also because his first action as emperor was devaluing the currency so that he could pay off the Praetorian Guard. Commodus might have been weird and kind of a clown, but he was also entertaining for the masses. Didius, however, was an embarrassment. As the main sources, such as Cassius Dio and the Historia Augusta, inform us, people were openly mocking and laughing at him whenever he appeared in public, even throwing stones to block his path. Didius's polite gesture of demanding that his co bidder and father in law Sulpicianus be spared was seen as a weakness, adding to his image as a puppet. Outside of Rome, the troops were unamused. Three different armies rebelled at once, each hailing their commander and emperor. The one closest to Rome was Septimius Severus, who immediately began the march on the city. Didius tried to quickly drill the Praetorians, but their lavish lifestyle and fancy swords had no hope of standing a chance against trained field soldiers. After a few exchanges and some skirmishes, it became clear that even the huge amount of money wasn't worth their lives so they abandoned their chosen emperor en masse, leaving Didius unprotected. Even his former colleagues in the Senate deserted him. Not only did they proclaim Septimius Severus to be the rightful emperor, but they sentenced Didius Julianus to death. And so it was noted in Historia Augusta, finally it was proposed that the imperial power be taken away from Julianus by order of the Senate. This was done, and Severus was forthwith acclaimed emperor, while it was given out that Julianus had taken poison. Nevertheless, the Senate dispatched a delegation, and through their efforts, Didius was slain in the palace by a common soldier while beseeching the protection of Caesar, that is to say, Severus. His last words are said to have been, from the history of Cassius Dio, What evil I have done, whom have I killed? 
All in all, this guy seems not to have been a bad fellow. According to Historia Augustus, he was very affable at banquets, very courteous in the manner of petitions, and very reasonable in the matter of granting liberty. That's from Historia Augusta. And seeing as his reign began and ended without much support and was too short to make much of an impact on the further history of the empire, it is impossible to say what his leadership might have looked like in other circumstances. Judging by some of the emperors, both in his past and still to follow, he probably wouldn't have been the worst. But buying the title emperor and with money that he didn't have and with the armies near Rome, well, what was he thinking? But something good for him now. Ironically, it has to do with the thing that dragged him into the whole debacle, namely coin. Coins of the emperor Didius Julian are surprised by coin collectors, but are also important to archaeologists. Since he ruled for such a gloriously short time, any coins minted during his reign are relatively rare. Furthermore, they are dated with an accuracy archaeologists only vaguely dream of. You will notice that in museums, ancient objects are sometimes dated very vaguely, like a cup of the 5th to 6th century, or if you are lucky, you get something like late 5th century. The reason is that objects rarely give a specific date, let alone the month. The coins do often bear the year they were minted in, but this is also also partially unreliable. The key here is continuity. A long-lived king would issue many coins, and if he belonged to a dynasty, those coins would continue circulating long after his death. But an emperor who ruled for only 66 days, first of all, his coins would be rare. Second, the dating can be relatively precise, as they were possibly not circulated after his death, also given the various monetary reforms that followed. If found by archaeologists amidst a collapsed living room, they almost have the exact date, spring to midsummer of the year 193 AD. D, and this will help date the various items that the coin was found with. And since we are at the subject of coin, time to talk about a bit of propaganda and once more feel some sympathy for Didius. The kind of imagery put on the coins was very carefully chosen, as in a world without press and TV, it was the most widely spread mass medium with which the political agenda would have been propagated on one side and the emperor's face on the other, the aptly named head side. So Augustus would have shown on the tail side a crocodile with the sign Egypto Capta, Egypt Captured, to declare his victory over Egypt. Other coins would show personifications of victory, or Rome, or clemency, referring to various achievements of the emperor in question. Didius, however, had nothing to boast about. Some coins of Didius show the horn of Almathea, or Cornucopia. It is the magical horn of plenty, traditionally held by Fortuna, the goddess of luck. It could be an indication of the hope that he could find the money he needed for the payments, and with some luck, all would be fine, and he could figure out a way to bring his people to prosperity and plentiness, but, well, alas. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.